again, just happy to be here listening to you guys for a long time, uh, especially out on the road recruiting uh, when we can kind of catch up on podcasts. And obviously during this uh, COVID stuff, there's been a lot of time to to listen to a ton of podcasts. So it's been fun. But um, just my story, I'm, I'm originally from Lubbock, Texas. I was born here and um, went to high school out at Shallow Water High School right outside Lubbock, a little small school out here. And, um, you know, grew up in West Texas at an interesting time and in that Mike Leach was, was getting his thing going on at Texas Tech and, and the Bobby Knight was the basketball coach out here. So it was a cool time to be out in Lubbock and there wasn't a whole lot to do other than go to these Texas Tech sporting events. Um, so I was exposed to, to high level college athletics at an early age and got to see all kinds of cool athletes come through here and uh, just fell in love with college football and the Big 12 and knew from an early age that I wanted to play Big 12 football and, and got the opportunity to walk on at Baylor and uh, was at Baylor at a really interesting time too with our brows taking on over there and um, you know just really got to see a program change um, from one of the worst probably the worst team in, in power five football to to you know, multiple bowl wins and, and multiple Big 12 championships and was kind of there at the, at the beginning of it and got to see kind of the, the base of, of changing a program. So that was pretty neat. And since this is an, an offensive line podcast, I'm going to throw some O-line level on, on some of these schools I've been to. But the, the offensive line coach at Baylor was Randy Clements. And um, I know you guys played at Houston, right? Did, and I don't think y'all crossed paths with Coach Clem. No, I, I, yeah, I was at Houston, but I was never, no, I don't, I don't remember that name. Yeah. I think he was there before you, but anyway, he, Riles. yeah, yeah. So yeah. he, you know, he's, he's at Ole Miss now and, and, um, really good offensive line coach. I don't think he got a, as much credit as he probably deserved at, at just some of the, the offensive linemen that he developed and recruited there and, and, and some of the, the run schemes that, that he kind of established, but. Um, after college, well, I'll back up a little bit. I, I walked on at tight end for a couple of years, um, and realized I wasn't a very good football player. So I knew I wanted to coach in my last two years, I was a student coach. So that ended up being a really, uh, good move for me and kind of got a head start in coaching and, and the receiver coach at Baylor at the time was Dino Baber. So I got to work for him and, and, um, got to work with him for a number of years at a, at a few different schools. So. That was a really good experience for me. And right after college, I took a job at West Texas A&M, a Division II, really good Division II program out here in West Texas. And our O-line coach there was Billy Best, who's now the O-line coach in Nevada. Um, and he was our offensive coordinator as well. And just um, really good coach, um, had a really good understanding of, of matching the run game with the pass game and, and kind of an overall view of, of the entire offense. Um, Spent one season there, and then Coach Babers got the Eastern Illinois head job and hired me to coach receivers up there. So went up there and, and uh, had two amazing years. We had a really good team. Uh, Jimmy Garoppolo happened to be on that team uh, when we got there. Uh, so we were there for his junior and senior year, and, and uh, just two amazing years with, with some really good football players and won a bunch of games. And um, our offensive line coaches there were Brian Callahan, um, who's now at Minnesota as the offensive line coach does a phenomenal job, just an excellent evaluator and developer of offensive linemen. Um, and he's worked his way up and, and now doing it at a really high level in Minnesota. And um, they're obviously having a ton of success. And then uh, Matt Maddox was also the offensive line coach there our second year. Um, who's also a Houston guy played, at, yeah. played off the line at Houston. Um, and I've worked with him at three different schools. So I'll mention him again. <laughs> oh, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so he, he took over at Eastern Illinois, and then we all went to Bowling Green together after our second year there and had two really good years at Bowling Green and, and um, won the MAC in 2015. Um, and Sterling Gilbert, who was our offensive coordinator, him and Matt it left Bowling Green after one year and went to Tulsa, and then Mike Lynch took over, um, and Mike is now at Syracuse. So. Um, did a phenomenal job as well. Um, and, and Mike is unique in that he can coach a ton of, ton of different positions. Um, he has coached everywhere, recruited everywhere. He can give you the best restaurant recommendations of wherever, wherever you need to go. So love, love Mike Lynch. Um, after Bowling Green, went down to the University of Texas and met back up with 
uh, Sterling Gilbert and Matt Maddox. And we were only there one year, and um, but we ran the football really well. Uh, we had the Doak Walker Award winner that year um, with uh, Foreman and ran the ball really well. And, and Coach Maddox did an excellent job there. And speaking of run the power, man, we, we ran some power at Texas that year. Um, yes. And it was, you know, I, some people forget about, I guess, that season and that year because we didn't win – a ton of games, but we, we ran the football really well. Um, and, and I'll always remember some of the, the runs we had and, and, you know, and we won some big games. We beat Notre Dame in the opener, which was a big one, um, and knocked off a couple other ranked teams. But anyway, um, you know, unfortunately coach strong got fired after that season and kind of, I kind of caught a lucky break after that year. I, I, um, got, Basically, uh, got an interview with Brent Brennan, who had just taken over the job, the head job at San Jose State, and ended up getting the offensive coordinator job there. And he kind of took a, a chance on a young guy to be a first time coordinator, and went out there to San Jose State and learned a ton, um, learned a ton about how to be a coordinator, and, and kind of laid the foundation there. And they uh, they've built that program over, up over the last three or four years, and I think they're going to be a really good football team this year. But um, ultimately, um, after one year there, I decided to go to Kent State, and it was because Sean Lewis, who's our current head coach, got that job and called and offered me the, the coordinator job out there. And, um, you know, Sean's a guy that I worked with at Eastern Illinois and, and Bowling Green and just knew that he had a, a great plan for what we were going to do and um, knew that he was going to be successful and, and also felt really comfortable coming back to the MAC. Um, after our couple years of Bowling Green, just felt like between him and I and, and a lot of the staff members that he hired that we had a good grasp on the recruiting territory and, and what that conference is and, and knew that we could make some moves in that conference. And so decided to go to Kent and um, going in our third year now and, and uh, have enjoyed every minute of it and kind of starting from the bottom and building it up. And our offensive line coach here is, is a guy named Bill O'Boyle, who's um, got a ton of head coaching experience. He was the head coach at Shadron State for a while and uh, just a really hard-nosed, tough O-line coach. And he's really built some toughness and depth. And our O-line has come a long way in, in the two and a half years that we've been there. So really enjoying it there. And and uh, I know I went kind of long on that, but that's that's kind of my coaching journey as of, uh, as of right now. Well, Coach, the, the big thing that I always like to ask, you know, coordinators, uh, especially offensive coordinators, because I can understand that side of the ball a little bit more, was coordinator, was that something that you had always, I mean, since you started uh, you being a student coach, did you always say, man, I want to be a coordinator? I mean, I've never gotten that itch. I mean, I've wanted to be a great offensive line coach and have never really gotten the itch to be a coordinator. Is Is that something that comes or is that something that, from day one, you're like, man, I want to be a, I want to be a coordinator. And then how did you decide, okay, now it's the time to make that jump? Well, it kind of came to me probably earlier than I was ready for it. Um, I, I just got a lucky break and, and was kind of thrown in the fire and, and knew I wanted to do that. Um, but had to learn a lot on the fly. I think that's with any job that you, that you take that's, that's new. Um, you're never really fully prepared for it until you actually take it and, and get the experience. But I, I do want to be a head coach someday, and I, and I, I do kind of – I guess I did understand that there's certain steps you got to take, um, and you don't have to be a coordinator to be a head coach, but I certainly think that it helps. And so I – you know, you can never fully prepare and plan exactly how your coaching career is going to go, but I did know that I want to be a coordinator someday. So I kind of, you know, prepared, and, and um, I've, I've always tried to learn different positions. Um, I've coached running backs and receivers and tight ends. And so, um, you know, I'm always looking to learn offensive line play and quarterback play and know that I need to, you know, to be a really good coordinator, you've got to be an expert really at, at all, at all those positions. So I'm constantly trying to learn, um, all of those and, and still learning every day. As a guy that me personally wished I could have been a tight end. I was just a, an unathletic offensive lineman. Um, I look at it from, you know, from, schematically and think we should have our tight end go to receiver then we should have him come to fullback and then he needs well he needs to know all the pass routes and then he needs to know all the run plays but then also we can put our tailback out at receiver and now we can use our tight end and and pass protection and then we can run some 
RPOs with our with our you know with our super back and we can have him you know lock and run ISO and now he can you know he can do this where it's it, it is so dangerous to let him do all these things but now you're telling him you know to learn almost more than the quarterback has to know how do you as a coordinator you know use that guy a lot but not get it so overcome because now he's got all the formations as well how do you let him do a bunch because it, it kills a defense I think but not overload that kid or that position yeah it's definitely an interesting position to coach because of all the reasons you mentioned I mean just all the different stuff that they have to do the different positions they have to work with but we've we've always moved our tight end around a ton um, that was one of our staples when we were at Eastern Illinois and, and at Bowling Green a little bit is just having a versatile tight end that you can that you can split out and play in line or as an H back. And if you have somebody that can do that, you're able to get into a ton of different formations with the same 11 guys and us being a tempo team. That is huge for us to, to get into 10 personnel formations, 11 personnel formations with the same 11 guys and, and play an entire drive like that is, is a huge advantage. So our tight ends have to be intelligent. They have to have a good football IQ and, and we do put a lot on those guys. So, it takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of reps. Um, those guys spend a lot of time in the meeting room, like much like what you talked about with the quarterbacks, probably not quite as much as those guys, but they've got to put in the extra time and, and first of all, get, know how to get lined up. And then, um, you know, then we can add some stuff as we go. And obviously it helps to have older tight ends and guys that have, have experience and have played, but we will move those guys around quite a bit. So we, we challenge those guys for sure mentally. Coach, can you talk a little bit about, you know, working for a guy like Sean Lewis, you know, youngest head coach in, in the FBS, and, and he's just lighting the world on fire. I mean, I followed you guys quite a bit this year, and it was just, it was just fun football to watch. So, I mean, how did you kind of know that, that he was going to, you know, do what he was going to do, and, and what kind of instilled that confidence in you, obviously going all the way back to Eastern Illinois? Yeah, he's an interesting guy. Um, you know, he's he's from the south side of Chicago and he played football at Wisconsin. So he's got that Big Ten toughness to him. And um, – but but you mix that with when, with the offense that we've ran at Eastern Illinois and, and the other spots that we've been and now Kent. And so he's got a great mix of having this really hard-nosed Big Ten background but also a modern spin with the tempo – spread style offense and, and he's done a great job combining the two and so schematically he's got an interesting mix that, that not a whole lot of people have just with his background but as a head coach he's got a, a another great mix of he's the youngest head coach in the country so he's highly energetic relates really well with the players but he's also um, kind of an old soul in that he's extremely wise he's extremely organized he's disciplined so he's got He's got a really good mix of young and old combined with his offensive background. And it's just, he, he's just an excellent head coach. And he's, uh, you know, had a plan from day one here and, and what we want to do and what we want to do offensively and how we want to recruit and and how we're going to discipline our players and, and, and everything. And so far it's worked out really well. And now we've got to back that up and sustain it. And my other question was going to be, you know, I, I've obviously gotten to know Coach O'Boy a little bit through a few people, you know, talk a little bit about, you know, him being the O-line guy and you coaching some of the tight ends, you know, that kind of dynamic and that kind of relationship, you know, how much you lean on him maybe, you know, for protections and his experience. That's got to be a, a really cool, you know, mentor to have, you know, a guy that's coached for 30 plus years. Yeah, for sure. He's got a ton of experience coaching offensive line and he's got, he's also got that head to coach experience, which really pays off um, anytime Coach Lewis has certain questions, you know, head coach questions or myself or, um, you know, anyone on our staff. But, you know, schematically and, and, and offensively, he's just – he's seen everything from, from a defensive perspective. He's, he's ran every run. So anytime we want to put in a new run, um, he's, he's typically ran it before and taught it before. So it helps to have that experience. And then the, the number one thing I think about when I – when when I think about Coach O'Boyle is just toughness. He, he's a really hard nosed individual, um, and and he's really developed toughness with our guys. And but he's got a good mix of he's got a great personality too. He's not um, just on his guys all the time. They they really play hard for him and really respect him. So 
Um, like I said earlier, our offensive line has come a long way. We kind of started from scratch, and we had seven guys when we first got there that that first spring. And jeez, um, yeah. And so we've we've just you those know, springs are brutal when you got seven. Yeah. I mean that I've heard that happen to a few different colleges just because there are injuries or guys leave. You know whatever that mix is, and you go into spring, you got seven. You know offensive linemen. Yeah. You're like, what are we doing spring? It can happen, as, yeah, especially in tra- in coaching transitions. Um, so we had to be a little bit creative that spring and move some guys around and and change kind of how we practiced. But just to see where where we started and where we are now, just from a depth standpoint and and some of the guys now that have um, started two years for us we've we've come a long way and and a lot of the credit goes to him for sure but again just when we're game planning and and when we're putting together um, different run packages or goal line packages or whatnot it's just really nice to to lean on his experience so when you know obviously you've got coaches around you and you've been around a bunch of different systems that you could probably run like you said just about whatever run scheme uh, you could want to put in. How do you narrow that down? How do you decide this is what we're going to do? This is what want to be, especially when there's so many different things that you probably think you probably could be good at, but you know you've got to narrow it, you know, at least somewhat. How how do you as a coordinator go about th- that thought process of, okay, these are the things we're going to be good at. This is what we're going to be known for. Yeah, it always – we're always going to start with inside zone and power. I mean, we want to be a downhill inside the tackles run team. So – we're pretty much going to have that every week. Um, but we, there's a lot of stuff we like, we, we like to run and, and we're probably a lot more broad than most teams are with the amount of runs we carry into a game. Um, like you said, you do have to narrow it down and make sure you guys know how to run it and um, know how to block different fronts and that, that sort of thing that you're going to see that week. But um, it's always going to start with those two runs and we're going to get really good at those two. And then I think you can, build off of power and build off of inside zone you know when you talk about power we're going to put different runs into that into that family that that gap scheme family where okay now we're going to run counter but a lot of the rules are still the same as power um so again we're going to start there and build off of that and uh, we are going to go into games with a lot of runs but um as, as as long as our guys are kind of following their base rules then we feel like that we can handle that. Coach, I, I love it. I mean, that's kind of always been my philosophy too. And then you, you're always dealing with coaches who are like, hey, coach, quote, how are we going to get the ball on the perimeter? You know, knowing you're going to have the, the two downhill schemes. What are some things that you do, you know, be it the, the screen game, the power read, you know, quarterback runs? How do you guys then kind of, you know, mesh off of your two base runs to get the ball to the perimeter against defenses that are giving you that? Yeah, I think it all depends on who your quarterback is, first and foremost. Um, how well they run, how how much hit, you know, how many hits they can take, what they can handle mentally. Um, so there's going to be certain quarterbacks that we're going to run 15 times a game. There's some we may want to run two or three times a game. But I think it starts with your quarterback when you're talking about the quarterback run game. Um, but, but it also starts with the quarterback when you're talking about RPOs and screens and that kind of stuff, too, and what they're comfortable with. But We've got all kinds of stuff to get the ball on the perimeter. Uh, we can tag routes to power or zone. Um, we can, you know, like you, like you said, our power read, a lot of the same rules for the offensive line is just like power. You know, there's there's some tweaks here and there, and, and there's obviously tweaks in the backfield, but it all goes back to the, to the base, to the, to the base rules. So we'll run a lot of different stuff. We'll have perimeter runs. Uh, we've got some perimeter runs where the box – the, the offensive line doesn't even know what's going on on the perimeter. They're just running their normal, you know, inside zone or whatever it may be. So um, we've, we've gotten pretty creative with different ways to get the ball on the perimeter. Um, and like I said, the offensive line may not necessarily know where the ball is going, but um, we always want to keep it simple for those guys. And we always want to want them to play fast and not be thinking too much. Um, but we will, we will constantly come up with different ways to, to get the ball out. And we're, we're a big screen team as it is, just um, not necessarily like RPO bubbles, but um, running back screens and tunnel screens and that kind of thing. So um, that's, that's kind of a different bucket of the offense. But we're, we've, we've got a pretty wide range of, of plays for sure. 
Okay, Coach, you talk about, you know, what I think of as like the real screens, you know, tailback tunnel screens, you know, maybe mm-hmm. the double screen. And and my coaching mentor, which is Coach Walls, always said the, the coaches that are really good, they run screens really well. Yeah, it's, it's been one of his big things that you can tell a team's really well coached up if they if they run really good screens because it's not something that, you know, he said you can just throw out there. It's something that you've got to work a lot. So – with being a, a fairly big screen team, I would assume you guys are successful at it or you wouldn't run it. What are you guys – how do you as a coordinator, how are you guys putting it in? How are you working on that with your offensive line? I mean, that can get really difficult at times, whether you're to the boundary or you're to the field. The same screen can be different. Is it two receivers or three receivers? I mean, it all gets – can be so specific or some guys are very nonspecific with it. How do you, you know, put that in practice to where you guys are so successful with it on Saturday nights? Yeah, you're definitely right. There's a lot of orchestrating a lot of different people when you're running a screen. There's a lot of moving parts and a lot of stuff going on, um, and it can be rather expensive. But we start with putting it in day one, and we rep the heck out of it. And we have a period where we'll do screens on air, and we will put certain defenders on defense, whether it be a manager or an assistant coach or an extra offensive lineman or whatever. We will put certain people – out on defense and, and kind of move those guys around in space and, and we'll work on cutting a lot. I think, I think, you know, we're still pretty aggressive when it comes to cut blocks within the rules. Um, and, and they seem to change every year, but we, we always find out as soon as we can what the cut blocking rules are <laughs> and, and find out the best way that we can do that within the rules. So um, we're always going to be aggressive with those. And then I think the main thing right now, um, especially with the lack of cutting is when your offensive linemen are out in space and they've got to go block a linebacker 10 yards downfield or a safety or whoever it may be out in a lot of space, that is really hard. And, and that's, I think, one thing offensive line coaches are trying to figure out right now is how do I teach my guy to – because you see so many guys just out in space and just totally whiff, and you can't dive anymore, which was the old way to do it. Yeah, that's how throw. I was always taught. Throw yeah, and just, let your tailback go the opposite way of exactly. wherever he goes. Because, you, you know, when an offensive lineman throws, that's a lot of space to cover, and the, the safety or whoever is – they've got to get out of the way. And so you can't do that anymore. And so we've we've tried to come up with different ways to to get our offensive linemen to break down and, and change some direction and, and at least get some hands on those guys. And that's that's something that we've worked on a lot. But – to answer your question again, just the amount of reps we get. You have to rep the heck out of it, and and uh, it's something that we do and something that we believe in, and so we consistently run it and practice and, and get a lot of looks at it. Well, as as an off, former offensive lineman, uh, that it, it makes me tired just thinking about screen drill because we had it. But as a coach, I hate, like, doing sprints at the end of practice. I think that it just is the kids aren't working very hard and you're not getting much out of it, but – if, when you can have drills like screen drills and, and put them, you know, at certain parts of your practice, you're getting game-like conditioning and you're getting screens and your kids aren't having to line up on one sideline and run to the other sideline and back and, and are doing that at half speed. So as much as I didn't like that as an offensive lineman, it's, it's much better than, than having to run 10, you know, overbacks at the end of practice. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. The, because of the way we practice with, with – like you said, the screen drill and just getting a bunch of reps in general, we don't really condition after practice because, like you said, that kind of takes the place of the conditioning. So our guys are in good shape with you know after five, ten practices of doing that. So we don't feel like we really need to run those gassers after practice or whatnot. And the other thing is we we want to recruit pretty athletic offensive linemen that, that can move and that aren't sloppy and – that can get out out into space and, and run and, and can also go through a 10 or 12 play drive. So that's really important to us again, to recruit those guys and to get those guys in a shape where they can do it. And we push them really hard in practice. And then by the time we get to the game, the conditioning factor is much easier than it would be in practice. Coach, I'm looking at, you know, when you said the seven offensive linemen, I, I pulled up your guys' roster and, and what you just said is true. I mean, you got a lot of guys that, you know, would be considered, quote, small by a lot of people's standards. But I would imagine those dudes were phenomenal athletes and phenomenal football players in high school. You know, to be 6'4", 6'5", 
you know, 275, 280, it's almost kind of unheard of, but I think, you know, and I know Coach O'Boyle being a, you know, a stretch zone guy when they were at Shadron, I mean, he loved those athletic linemen. Yeah, for sure. That's, that's probably the number one thing he looks for uh, after toughness and and showing physicality on tape. But yeah, we want guys that can run and are athletic um, and may not necessarily be the biggest guys, but um, you know, they're well conditioned, like I said, and, and the other thing is we, we really like wrestlers. We've got quite a bit of wrestlers on our, on our offensive line too. Um, and that's one thing I think I, I know wrestling's really big in Oklahoma, but I know it's, it's big up here in the Midwest. And so um, there, there's a lot of these guys that do wrestle. And I think that helps too. And you got to be a pretty, pretty good shape to wrestle. So uh, those are just things we look for. Not necessarily, not necessarily the biggest guy. They don't have to be 300 pounds in high school, um, but we want tough guys that can move. Coach, I think that – go ahead, Walls. Yeah, I was just going to ask you, you know, you talk about your, your screen game, you know, how many different ways do you get those guys out? I mean, is it is it one one screen where, you know, you're getting both guards and the center out? Is it another screen where, you know, you're getting the tackle and the guard out play side? Or, you know, I've seen a lot of people, if you run a lot of power, you know, blocking back with the tackle and the center and they both get out. How many different kind of screen, you know, schemes do you have with your offensive line getting out of their normal alignment? Yeah, we we've, we've got quite a bit and we've all five guys are going to pull pull out and run at some point. Um, you know, we, and everything we run, we can run both ways. So, you know, we've got our traditional guard center guard releasing down the middle um, and there's a number of different people we can throw that ball to, but those nothing changes for those guys as far as they're targeting and and them going straight down the middle of the field, but we've got those, we've got um, the guard and the play side guard and tackle getting out on both sides. Um, we haven't quite got to that power screen yet, but I've seen people run and I love it. Um, so at, at some point you're going to have to pull as a, or, or release on a screen as an offensive lineman, but there are multiple ways to get that done. You know what, when I was at Houston, obviously we were in quite a few screens. The one screen that I always thought was awesome and was going to work and it never did. And, and maybe you guys run it. And so maybe you could, you could help me with it, but, uh, is like, we were running like outside zone to the left and the right guard, right tackle are taking two steps like it's outside zone. And then they're planting their foot and now tackle kicks out for the receiver. And now the receiver is coming back underneath outside of outside zone. Uh, every year I thought it was going to work and it was going to be great. And I loved it because I was a tackle and got to get out. And it seemed like it got intercepted in practice so many times that we never ran it in the game. Have you guys worked that at all? Have you got that in on games? Does, it scares me to death now as a coach to even think about it just because of how poorly it did in practice, but it wasn't really a main thing for us. Yeah, we have not got to that one. I have not okay. ran that one before, but it sounds very interesting. We'll have to, we'll have to take a look at it. It's, it scares me. Don't don't look at it, Coach. <laughs> I think it's just ready for an interception. So you were talking about, you know, the, the guys that you recruit, and and I, I've said it a long time about, like, Tulsa and, and the University of Houston even, but it's, you know – it seems like there's a lot of programs that are looking for the kid that's six six and he's three hundred and twenty pounds and and you know obviously Alabama and Oklahoma and, and those guys get those kids and and it's easy for me as a high school guy to say to say this and so I'm curious how much leeway you guys have but you know at Houston some of our best linemen were we got a guy from Germany that was six eight but he was only you know I think he was two hundred and forty pounds in high school you know, whatever that was in Germany, high school or, or whatever. And so, but then he, after a year or two, grew into, you know, an, an NFL type offense alignment. But, you know, obviously the Alabamas and the LSUs didn't offer him out of high school because he, he wasn't quite there yet. But our coaches, uh, I think that was when Bryles was there, could see the potential of this kid coming in. And, and you know, or like you said, you know, maybe it's that undersized tackle, but maybe it's the the not very athletic tight end that's, pretty tall but he doesn't do a whole lot in high school they don't throw it to him often and so he gets overlooked obviously each year you've probably got to have you know a couple kids on your offensive line that you're pretty sure about how much leeway do you guys have as a college in recruiting in a recruiting class to take a couple kids that you know for a fact hey they're not going to play as freshmen they were going to redshirt them probably not going to play as freshmen but hey as as a sophomore maybe, but definitely as a junior, this kid could be a big time talent. Yeah. I think as you are at a program longer, like we're going in our third year. So like 
we're, we're at a point now where we do feel like we've got a little bit of depth and that we can take some of those project type guys. But when you're at our level and, you know, I guess any group of five level or FCS, like you've got to be really creative in how you evaluate offensive linemen. And if you are looking for a six, four plus tackle, you have to find that guy that may be 240 in high school, like you were talking about. And that's always, that's always hard because you don't know if they're going to get, you don't know if they're going to stay at 240 in college or if they're going to be able to get to 290 or 300 in college. So, you know, there's certain things that we look for, like we're big on waist size as being an indicator of how big somebody can get and then arm length and, and hand size. And there's some things you can look at and, and it's hard when, it's hard as a college coach to get all that information, especially now with us not having camps and that sort of thing. Right. You know, we're not, we're not NFL scouts where we have all the numbers. So we have to be creative and we have to do our due diligence and do our homework and, and research these guys. And, and you really have to have some indicators on, on these, on these skinny guys, if they can actually put on the weight. Um, so, and, and, you know, you look at things like how big is their dad and do they have any big brothers? And there's a lot of different things you can look at. Um, but um, th- those, when, when you can find somebody like that, that's six, five, six, 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 seven, and, and they can put on the weight to get to around 300 and they've got the feet and the toughness. And um, th- those are the guys that end up getting drafted out of the, out of the smaller schools. Right. So it does happen every now and then it's hard to get a ton of those guys that, end up being great players but that's kind of what you're always looking for for sure well then and and i know and and i think it probably gets harder because it's now your reputation as a coach or a recruiter so it's easier said than done by a high school coach but even some of these you know the guys that i played with that were short guys they came into houston and and like you said it's hard to measure their arms but if they've got long arms they've kind of got the best of both worlds. They're, they're longer, but they've got a low leverage point. And if they're just complete ass kickers in high school, some of the best D linemen, offense linemen I've been around have been those short guys that, that we've taken a chance on. Now, I, I know when you take a guy that's 6'1", uh, and he doesn't pan out, then it's probably a lot, a, a lot you know, more I told you so than if you take the kid that's 6'6", and he doesn't pan out. Which so uh, and, and if you've been in a program longer, maybe you have – more opportunities to take that kid. But uh, I, I think there's obviously some really great talent out there that the big schools, you know, are going to have to take five-star kids in their state because they're in their state and they're a big school and they're a five-star kid, but maybe he, or four-star, but he's, he's not as good of a player, but he's just got the measurable. So it's always awesome to see how teams can develop linemen that weren't thought of to have the size or the measurables or the weight in high school, but then they develop – continually develop those kids into great college football players. Yeah, there's no doubt. There's there's been some incredible college football offensive linemen that are six foot, six one, six two. Um and like you said, the, the arm length helps and just the tenacity and toughness of those guys, they're they're usually always really tough. Um you know, I, I don't think you can take a ton of those guys. Uh, you've got to pick right. and shoot and make sure that, that you've got the right ones. You don't want to you don't necessarily want a, a five of your starters to all be six one, six two, and in, in Division One. But um, as long as you are picking the right guys, you can definitely get away with two or three of them for sure, and, and they can end up being really good players. Um, and our our best offensive lineman at Kent State right now is probably about six two and a half, and and he's going to be a four year starter and have a chance to play in the NFL. So, right uh, there, there's definitely a lot of them out there for sure. Well, since we're already kind of talking recruiting, I think probably the, the and we've already talked about about them a lot, but tight ends. I think tight ends can be even maybe more difficult, at least for where I am, like in high school. Uh, you always want this big, freaky-looking tight end, but if there's a big, freaky-looking kid like that at our high school, unfortunately, he's probably not playing tight end for us. He's playing, you know, outside linebacker or middle linebacker or, shoot, he might be playing tailback quarterback just because – you know, that, that's what you need them for in high school. How difficult is that for you guys to recruit at the college level when I, I would assume with tight end almost more than any other position, a lot of times in high school they're out of position. And so it's a lot of you guys, you know, what are you looking for at that tight end position? What are you trying to think of what's going to happen in the future with a kid like that? 
It is a really hard position to evaluate, like for all the reasons you said. I mean, a lot of times they're a quarterback in high school or they're a wide receiver. And um, the, the main thing that you've got to find out, first of all, what, you know, what are you looking for? Is it, is it an H-back, you know, a guy that can play in the box and, and be more of kind of a fullback? Or is it a, a guy you want to split out and play some receiver and bring back in? There's a lot of different types of tight ends. So I think, I think you have to start there. Um, one thing that we've got at our place is all of our tight ends are a little bit different. We've got a 5'10 little fullback who's played a ton of football for us, who's extremely smart and tough. And we've got a, a kid that when he first got there, he was a quarterback in high school and he was 6'4", like 195. And now he's – it's taken him years to get to the point where he is now and he's, he's going to play a ton for us this year. Um, and he's, he's up to about 235. Um, you know, so there's just – there's a lot of different types of, of ways you can get there. But I think it starts with just how you want to use them. And, and we'll find ways to use both those guys, and they're extremely different. Um, and and we'll, we'll be creative and and do some 12 personnel and, and some 11 personnel with those guys. But it, it is really hard. I mean, you have to – you have to see some sort of toughness on the tape. If it's a guy that's only playing wide receiver, okay, I've got to see some – I can't just see you run around and, and – and catch footballs and I've got to see some sort of toughness um you know I know you may you, you may be at a school that's air raid and and never ever uses an inline tight end but I, I got to see you maybe play some defense or go block somebody on the perimeter you know maybe go crack a linebacker um I think I think a lot of times really good tight ends are really good basketball players so what are they doing on the basketball court can I see some toughness you know, on your, on your basketball highlights, or if I go see you play basketball or whatever it may be, but kind of like what I was talking about with offensive linemen, like you've got to have, you've got to find those indicators somehow, some way of, Hey, this, this guy might be playing out of position right now. He may be a quarterback or a, or a receiver, but I can see him. He's got that edge to him where I can see him potentially being a tight end someday. I love that. I just just watching a bunch of old George Kittle highlights, and we coached against him. And he was at Norman Norman High, and he was, you know, a six four skinny wideout, you know, two hundred pounds, like you said. But he also played defense, and he'd strike people. So you know, I think it made the evaluation maybe a little bit easier. But you're still like, man, I didn't think he was going to be two hundred fifty pounds and road road grade and dies. But that's got to be so hard because, I mean, you'll, you'll hit the home runs and you'll have the other guy like, man, you know, I really missed on it. But at the same time, you know, those home runs you do hit completely changes an offense like your guys is, I mean, knowing that you guys are going to be, you know, a pretty big 11 personnel type team. Yeah, for sure. I love watching George Kittle play. Um, I actually just saw a clip on Twitter of him at Iowa just killing somebody and taking him into the sideline. But he's fun to watch, man. There's – there, there's a lot of really good tight ends in the NFL right now that are fun to watch between him and Kelsey. And I was just fired. I was so fired up for the Super Bowl this year. Watch those two guys go at it. And, um, you know, Kittle is just so fun to watch again because, like what you said, he just he's so tough, but then he can do everything in the pass game too. And um, it, it's it's exciting for sure. And um, it's like you said, he was a skinny wideout in, in high school and. You know, you just have to project, and, and it can be really hard sometimes, even though the NFL messes up a lot of times with those guys. So uh, you can get lucky sometimes with tight ends, and like you said, when you hit a home run, it's it's a big deal. Coach, I know you guys, you know, since you've been in it, you know, the days at Baylor, you know, going through Eastern Illinois with Dino and, and coaching at Bowling Green, you guys have always scored points. You guys have always gone fast, and you guys, you know, have always developed, you know, QBs, offenses, whatever you want to call it. I'm interested in hearing – you know, how you guys practice, you know, with tempo and how do you guys, you know, like you said, you know, pretty scheme heavy. How are you guys able to get all those things accomplished? And then at the same time, you know, limit your mental errors and score a ton of points. Yeah, I, I really love our practice culture. I think that's the one thing that we do really well is just, I think our guys understand what we want to get done and we are very efficient and and our staff led by coach lewis again is is highly energetic and i just feel like um, we make practice enjoyable for our guys and we get in and out and get our work done um, but to we get asked a, a lot how how do you go fast what are the procedures and, and the techniques and all that kind of stuff and, and the the number one answer and the, the simple answer is that 
it's it's what we do every day and everything it's just it's kind of just our way of life um from the way we lift weights to the way we meet to um the way we go from drill to drill it's just it's kind of just what the culture is is that hey everything we get we're doing it's going to be at a, at a at a fast pace um so our kids have that in mind going in and, and it gets better each year as, as you're at a program and then that combined with what we do schematically and and getting a ton of reps and like we talked about again earlier the the lack of conditioning after practice because we're doing it in practice I think it's just a combination of all of those things and um, and and uh, the kids enjoy it I think they enjoy coming to practice uh, we do make it hard on them you know we talk about the O-line having to run a lot we we run the crap out of our wide receivers um, and we push them really hard and when they get to the games it, it becomes easy because they've they've ran so much in practice but um, again I think if there's one thing that we do well for, as, as a program, um, it, it's the way we go out and do practice. And it's, it's the way that and – and it goes into the, to, to the weight room as well. Our, our head strength coach, Coach Sobel, um, is in perfect alignment with what we're doing, uh, you know, offensively. And he trains those guys to go out and do what we do in practice. So I think you've got to have alignment with um, your offensive – staff and your defensive staff and your strength staff and I think as long as all three of your coordinators and, and your whole coaching staff kind of knows what the end goal is and, and the style of play you want to play I think um, that's that's when you can get some a lot of things done when is that like installed and when is that I mean obviously it's preached every single day but how do you kind of go about you know again you don't have to give all the specifics but it's like you know, is there, you know, an early meeting? And I would imagine there's, you know, behind the scenes meetings, making sure, hey, this is who we are. This is what we do. Strength guys, this is how you're going to do it. How does all that kind of come to fruition? And then what are kind of the buzzwords and things you're saying? So everybody's on that same page. Yeah, well, we're really fortunate at, at Kent because our head coach, Sean Lewis, myself, our defense coordinator, Tom Kaufman, and our head strength coach, Jeff Sobel, we're all together at Eastern Illinois Bowling Green. Uh, those three guys were at Syracuse and now we're all together at Kent. So those four guys, we've, we've been together for almost 10 years now. Um, so that's a big part of it. Um, and that the head of the departments already kind of know what's going on. Um, the second thing is uh, I, I make sure one, every semester, you know, the, the opening meeting of spring practice or the opening meeting of fall camp, I make sure, to reiterate with the offense, like, Hey, this is, this is what our philosophy is. This is who we are. Okay. We're going to go fast. We're going to throw the, the deep ball. We're going to run the ball down the middle and that's who we are. And so we're telling that to them in those meetings at the, at the intro of, of every semester. And then um, from the walkthroughs to the practice, to the way we lift again, to the way we meet, it all flows and, and, and that, space. I mean, it all kind of goes by that. And, um, so again, it's just, it, it's kind of every day. Now when you're taking over a new program, like we have a few times, um, you've, you've got to teach it a little bit and, and you've got to teach it in those off season walkthroughs. Um, you know, this is how we do it. This is who we are and we're going to get lined up really fast and you've got to start with the basics. You've got to teach them the formations and all we, all we did for the first week was line up in formations really fast you know, and then you're putting in plays and then you're practicing and then so on and so forth. But I think it's important that we, we reiterate and remind our guys uh, periodically, Hey, this is who we are. This is, this is what we do. Coach, I'm kind of curious with such a broad um, array of things to choose from. What is your, um, what is your process on a, on a Sunday when you come in or Monday, whatever day you guys decide to come in and you're looking and you're game planning What's the first thing that you're doing? Are you looking at it, how they line up by formation? Are you looking, you know, at, at their dudes and, and how we get it? Are you looking at first your dudes and how to get them compared? What is your, you know, your process of nailing down and starting to figure out that game plan uh, going into a Sunday? Yeah, for sure. I, th I think everybody kind of sees the, the game in a different way based on what the position they coach or their experience or whatnot. And so we've all got a little bit different jobs. Um, the way I see 
game planning, at least from the beginning of the week, I, I see it more as people than X's and O's. Like I really want to know who their guys are, who we can pick on, who their best player is, all that kind of stuff. And I want to know that early. Um, so what I'm the, the first time we start looking at opponents is Sunday night and we'll just watch a couple games. And I just want to get the, the flow for who these guys are, how aggressive they are, you know, what kind of their base schemes are, their base alignments, all that kind of stuff. But the main thing I want to know is who, who are the, the guys. Um, and so I feel like after Sunday night, I've got a, a decent feel for who the guys are. And then one thing that, that I've done my whole career and, and I've continued to do it as the coordinator, just cause I, I really like to do it and it, and it makes me know the opponent better is I still do our personnel uh, scouting report. Um, and we're pretty in depth with it. I mean, we've got a page for each position group and, you know, so I'm taking notes on, you know, how many games this guy started, what his honors were, all that kind of stuff. And so I'll do that on Monday and go through every starter and backup. And so after I've done that, I have a pretty good idea, even on paper, like who their best players are, um, just, just by looking at stats and, and bios and all that kind of stuff. And then you match that up with the game tapes. Um, and then, I mean, that's before we even really start game planning. So I go into our formation game planning, having a decent idea of the personnel. And then we start diving into formations and situations and all that kind of stuff. So when you do, you, when you do that Sunday night and you watch those two or three games, are you, is that a cut up or are you, you guys literally, are you putting on and just watching their defense? Do you watch the whole game? I think that's where I've done such a poor job and I hear all these, these, and not that I, you know, run the whole offense, but I'm, in charge of the run game, most of it. And so I think what I do a poor job is, is right away I'm wanting to know how do they line up to what formations and, and it gets to where I don't even go through the game. But I've heard so many good coordinators say they watch the whole game and some guy, you know, the whole defense. Some say they watch the entirety of the game. What does that look like for you on a, on a Sunday night when you say you're watching the game? Yeah, it's it's just the defense and it's it's throughout the, the whole game. So – I, I will typically start with their most recent game, which is typically the, the day before. I'll watch right. that. Um, we've done a little bit of the TV copy stuff um, here and there. Um, you know, if, if a team we're about to play is on TV, I will certainly watch that and kind of get a feel for, for who they are. Um, but we don't always watch game tape or TV copies. Um, but, yeah, I will always start with the most recent game and watch every defensive clip all the way through and then typically go to the game before that and, and try to get two or three games in on that first night on Sunday night. Are you inputting anything on that? Are you jotting anything down? Or are you, you purely – I don't want to say like a fan, but are you purely just watching football like you would? Obviously not just like you would on, a, you know, on an NFL game, but are you just watching it, you know, truly watching through it? No, I've got, I mean, I've got a notepad with me at that point. I'm taking notes. I'm not inputting any data or anything like that, but I'm, I'm taking notes on gotcha. kind of what I see. And, and, you know, if it's a team that we played the, the previous year, maybe dig up some, some of our stuff from the, from last year, um, some old scouting reports or some notes that we may have taken or some old game plans or whatnot, but um, just kind of taking notes on the side. Gotcha. Yeah. I, I think that, it- and I didn't learn this till this year, and I feel like a horrible coach, but uh, we're playing, you know, a few really good teams, and, and I got to where I was just watching the game, and, and I never did this. And, you know, you spend a lot of time watching the game. It's a big game, and then it's like, I don't even remember what it was, but it was just something finally clicked of, of the way they were doing something. But it was something that I would have never, ever, ever picked up had I been looking for that or had I been looking through clips or looking through cut-ups. It was just – only you know by by watching it and it's something I've just done a, a really poor job but so it's interesting it'd be a good way to do it just to make myself hey on Saturday and put all of our data from the game and then just what are their most recent two or three just watch it through just watch their defense watch it through pad and pad and paper I love that I'm writing that down I mean so you can jot a few things down but you're not inputting anything yeah for sure and we're fortunate enough to have some GAs that input the sure. data but um, but yeah, I'm just kind of getting a, a feel for the flow of the game and, um, you know, seeing, I, I think there's just some, some things you can't necessarily see in a formation cut up or a, or a third down cut up. Um, just 
you know, maybe seeing if guys get tired or kind of what some substitution patterns are or, um, you know, oh, this guy is just wrecking this game. He's had 15 tackles and he's just dominating, you know, just some, some things like that. Coach, you said, you know, your guys' offensive philosophy, you're going to run it down the middle, you're going to go fast, and then you also got me jacked up when you said we're going to throw it deep. Um, you know, how many shot plays do you kind of take into a game? And, and then, again, how many, you know, are things, you know, where you get, you know, a man alert, some kind of look that you've seen and you're checking to it or you're trying to hit a vertical? Do you have kind of a baseline deal, you know, how many shots we're going to take or is it just kind of something, hey, man, this week these guys play a ton of tight coverage. We're going to be cranking the heck out of it. Well, we're always going to be a little aggressive throwing the football down the field no matter who we're playing. But um, and, and that's who we are, like I said. I mean, that's kind of what we recruit to. we got to make sure we recruit quarterbacks that can throw the deep ball and, and receivers that can run far and, and run fast and catch the deep ball. So <laughs> it's kind of built in and who we are. So we're going to do it consistently. Um, we've never really put a number on it. Um, you know, I've heard some coaches say that you want to take six shots during a game. And uh, there were times when I then I kind of had that written down on the call sheet and kind of tallied off six. And then I did that for a little bit and just forgot, um, totally forgot about keeping track <laughs> of it. But um, I, I don't know. I don't know if there's necessarily a plan. Certainly if there's a corner or a DB that, that we feel like we have an advantage on, that then, then we will. Um, or if there's a certain coverage or a defensive scheme that that uh, allows us to do it, we will um, a little bit more than maybe we normally would. But um, it's just kind of it's kind of who we are and, and what our philosophy is. But um, you know, that's again going back to what we're looking for on Sunday. Just always looking for those matchups, whether it's hey, we want to match up. Uh, we know our receiver versus this corner is going to be a good matchup, just based on where they're already lined up, or do we want to motion to something or show this look or whatnot? So those are different things we're looking for during the week. Is that something where you guys are, you know, choiced up with your receivers? So, you know, they got a couple of options, you know, Hey, it's a go route or a post, you know, if the guy's off, you can obviously, you know, stop it or, or shut it down. Or is that something where you guys just like, Hey man, when we're calling shots. It's locked and loaded. We're, we're cranking that thing deep. Yeah. We've done a little bit of both of that. Um, you know, and, and, I think it, it depends on who your players are again and how much they can handle. Um, but there's a lot of times where you definitely just want to lock it on and, and rip it. Uh, so we, we've done a little bit of both. That's one thing that, that I've noticed with, you know, with some of the group of five, like when I, Houston Tulsa's had some years, um, Baylor, I know they were not group of five, but before they were, you know, who Baylor is, who you think of them now, you could always get, some underrated, really fast receivers um, that could either catch something on the run and make it go 100 uh, or burn past a corner. You know, even at Houston, we're playing Penn State and some of those teams, and they got these big, good-looking corners, and we got a little five, you know, nine receiver that's 180 pounds but flies past the guys. You can throw it deep. You can throw it short and, and have those guys running. So I think it's a really cool thing to recruit to. You can have some real speed out – way more speed. I know that Alabama's got the guy that's 6'4 and, and runs a 4'6, but and, – and that is awesome, or, you know, or 4'5. But when you got a few guys running, you know, low 4'4s or 4'3s and they're small but are, are flying by them, you can win with, with that speed. And – I've got to imagine, and, and I'm only do this, uh, you know, I'm only work with the scout team quarterbacks, but um, they, I would assume it works to all quarterbacks. They love to let it fly. You know, well, I'm, I'm over there at scout team. I've said it a bunch, but I'm always, hey, well, it doesn't matter if you throw it an interception or not in scout team. And I know they want you to throw a little curl, but see the post on the backside? Chunk it, man. Have fun. Go throw it deep. Let's have fun playing football. It's it's got to be an, you know enjoyable for a quarterback to be a part of that system. There's no doubt. And the one thing when when you're recruiting those guys, we we never compromise on speed. We're always gonna look for the fast guys, and we're not we're just not gonna recruit a slow receiver. And I know everybody would say that, but there's still a lot of schools that do. Um, so we're 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 gonna always recruit the fastest guys we possibly can. Um, I think it helps when you're in states like 
you know, Texas or Florida where track is really important because then you have a tangible number that you can recruit off of. Right. And that's where Houston and Baylor and the schools that you mentioned, that's where they've really done well and had success. And then to me, when you show as a program, like, hey, this is who we are, this is what we're going to do, and, and you've put that on, on TV or on tape or on the stats, then you attract more of those same type of guys. That's why Baylor and Houston have had really fast receivers for 10 plus years now. Um, because I think it just kind of manifests itself and, and you just continue to get guys like that and you, you continue to get bigger and faster guys. But I think you just have to have a baseline of, Hey, this is exactly what we're looking for and we're not going to compromise on, on what we're taking. You touched on something that's huge. I mean, I think verified track speed, you know, and, and we're getting more into, you know, measuring our guys in, in miles per hour, as opposed to, you know, the handheld 40 crap. Cause you know, what was the surface? Who's the guy timing? I mean, it takes a lot of that, that guesswork out of it. You got verifiable times, you know, miles per hour is something you can really, really see. And, and kids now I think are starting to figure it out. Like this is, this is the premium. If you want to make money and go to college and you're a skill dude, you better have verified speed times. There's absolutely no doubt about it. Um, and I just, I love football players that run track and, because it teaches toughness. I mean, cause track is hard, man, especially when you're running like the 400 or the hurdles, like it's, you got to have some toughness to run some of those, some of those different races. So love guys that run track. And then it gives you, again, it gives you a tangible number. And that's, um, there's some States where track is really important and some where it's not. And, um, I think the States where track is important. The football is, is right on par with that. Typically the football coaches are making the guys run track anyway, and that's kind of how it works. But, um track is huge and unfortunately we didn't have a track season this year so we're missing a lot of numbers um mm -hmm. but uh it'll be interesting how it shakes out there may there may be some really fast kids there are some small schools next year we'll see that's what what'll be really interesting for those kids is is uh, i would assume there's going to be some some schools that that really steal some kids from some of these bigger schools because of the lack of film you know or the lack of like you said you know, guaranteed times, um, but those kids that slip through the crack but are really fast or would have put on great film, it's going to be uh, as bad as it is for the people that got hit with this bad. It's going to be really interesting and really fun to watch and see what that does to, to college football and, and you know, I would assume kind of even it out because the big schools are going to have to continue to go with the big kids that, that look really pretty but maybe don't have as much film as – you know, and, and it, I don't know, it'll be really interesting and fun for me to watch. Yeah, I agree. This recruiting class, this, this uh, 2021 class is going to be very interesting uh, when you look back at it in four or five years, kind of who ended up where and uh, some of the misses that may happen and some of the, the home runs that may happen. It'll be, it'll be very interesting, but um, just like everybody else and, you know, you've got to adapt and kind of overcome. And I'll, I'll say one thing that, that has been really good is that we've had so much time now to, to talk to these kids and their families and do zoom meetings. Like I feel like I know recruits in this class better than I ever have um, on a personal level. Um, so um, again, it'll, it'll be interesting to see what happens, but um, yeah, it, it, it's definitely a bummer that what there wasn't track season or spring football this year. So, um, but this, this next fall, you know, it looks like we're going to be playing football games, and so senior tape is going to be huge. Yes, that's, that's you know, it, it's been great for my kid. You know, I, I'm going to have five brand-new offensive linemen this year and, and a couple of them seniors, and that's the, the best thing I can tell them. And, and it looks like we might have some summer camps that we might get to do here in Oklahoma that, you know, I, it's not like the seniors that have played for – tons of years you know two years and have a lot of film hey guys if you want you know colleges still maybe don't have a great great idea of, of who they're going with and so it, you know d1 d2 you know probably d1 does but division two or division you know one double a or some of these you know division three schools they may not have as good of an idea you can really put some great stuff on film and and um they're gonna have to look at you because there just isn't as much film out there. So it'll be really, really good for, for guys like that. Um, Coach, we, we've kept you on, you know, now an hour. But uh, before I let you go, I always love to ask guys, when you're watching another team's offensive line, what's some things they'd be doing that would make you think highly of their, of their offensive line coach? Yeah, I, 
like I said earlier, man, I've listened to you guys for a long time, so I knew that question was coming. I want to be a little bit different. Um, <laughs> but, but one thing uh, that I always like to look at on tape is what, what we call policing the pile. And what that means is wherever the ball is going, um, typically a, a run, but it could be a pass to wherever the ball is going, that line is following the football. And they're cleaning up dudes on the pile. They're pushing the pile. Um, you know, if, if, if a running back is getting stood up and it's uh, right at the, the first down marker and he needs a little push, like I love seeing guys just get, get after it and, and get in the pile and follow the football. So I would say policing the pile and just um, I, I think you can really tell how hard guys play when, when you look at stuff like that and how much they enjoy the game. Completely agree, and, and I've never heard a great term for it. Now I have. I love it. I I'm, I'm wrote it down right now. Policing the pile is perfect. That was an old Randy Clements one. He did a really good job coaching that back in the day when I was in college. I remember when I was at Tulsa recruiting a couple of times in Texas, you know, up against, you know, Randy, and I knew once Randy kind of got on board, we weren't going to be able to compete, but – he was he was always a really nice guy. I mean, out on the road, I know Denver would say a lot of good things about him. But you know, it sucks as I I'd, I'd kind of find some of these guys I thought were maybe like you were saying earlier, you know, diamonds in the rough, the six five, two sixty type guys, and then Randy would kind of come moving in on him later, and I'm like, dang it, he's gone. <laughs> yeah, no, I've I've been really fortunate to be around some really good offensive line coaches. So it's uh, I envy you guys, man. I'm kind of like the 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 stepbrother being a tight end guy but <laughs> always uh always love offensive line guys you're every offensive lineman's dream <laughs> every everyone that goes to sleep they wish they were they were out at, at tight end <laughs>